Evening, everyone. The older we get, I think the harder it is to change your ways. You know, you can't teach a dog new tricks. But those things, sometimes they're things that we've had a whole life, that we've believed a whole life, we've been taught or we've done a whole lives. And suddenly something happens and we have to reframe our thinking. And it's really not easy. I um, had an example of that. It was actually quite a few years ago, though, when I went to England. And there, you know, my whole life in South Africa, I'd grown up saying, I'll do that just now. And of course, just now meant in half an hour or something like that. And this created quite a problem because just now in England means you'll do it right now. And so this was a really hard thing. It may sound silly, but maybe you can think of something in your life um, where you've really had to reframe your thinking. The Hebrews had to reframe their thinking because they had been brought up that you could never approach God except through an earthly priest and never without a sacrifice for sins. And we're going to look at this tonight. This is part of the reason we learned last week that they were really struggling in their faith. They were actually ready to throw in the towel and go back to being Jews and and give up their faith in Jesus because they were struggling with with what this meant and how the Old Testament and New Testament fitted together. So we're going to look at this tonight. It helps us understand Hebrews. What does it mean Jesus is our high priest? It's a theme of Hebrews. It also helps us understand how the Old Testament and New Testament fit together. But I think at the same time, and it'll probably be only nearer the end, where you'll suddenly realize that actually we're not that different from the Hebrews, although some of what they were doing seems very foreign to us, that actually some of our struggles are similar to what they're going through, and we can learn and be encouraged by those words ourselves. So I want us to journey, and we're going to do a bit of looking at the sacrifice system in the Old Testament. So journey with me. It's, it's good to learn these things. Um, and then when you read Hebrews, it can come alive more. You can understand what it was all about. So every Jew knew that it was dangerous. You could not approach God who was the sinless one because of your sinful state because God is holy we are sinful and just like light darkness cannot exist where light is so sin cannot exist where holiness is so there was this feeling that they could not approach God the only way they could do it was through the priest he was the go between the mediator he represented God to the people and the people to God And every day there was sacrifice in the temple. So if it had been here, 9 o'clock in the morning, you would have brought your um, your animal and they would have checked it to check it was unblemished. And 3 o'clock in the afternoon, it would have been sacrificed. So I don't know, they might have cleaned up the blood by now, um, but it was a pretty pretty messy thing. And this was every day. So how, how often did you actually have to sacrifice? Well, the onus was on you. You had to be continually saying, Well, have I sinned? What do I need to do? Have I been good enough? Have I been okay? Must I sacrifice? That was quite a thing, that there was this ongoing feeling of sin. It was always before you, the seriousness of sin. And had you repented, had you had a sacrifice for that sin? Because everyone knew that without the shedding of blood, there was no forgiveness. And they would have carried this burden with them all the time. And, and once a year, there was this big day. You might have heard of the term Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And atonement means covering over. It doesn't mean taking away. It means covering over. And this was the central act of Jewish worship, where all the worship came together. People would come from far to this act of worship. And the high priest would be the representative there, the representative of the people, and or pre- represent the people to God and God to the people, the one for the many. And he would, he would journey with this. So, and, and we know that he would ha- um, wear a breastplate. On the breastplate would be engraved the names of the people and on his shoulder, the names of those people that he bore as their representative. And the offering made on the Day of Atonement was for anything they haven't covered over. It was kind of to make sure that they'd covered all the last bases. So anything, any sin you'd done in ignorance, you hadn't done the sacrifice, this was to cover it. So on the Day of Atonement, the high priest was wearing his radiant robes. He would take them off. He would bathe himself to cleanse himself and sanctify himself and put on a new white robe. And then there would be the sacrifice of sin. First there'd be a ram for his own sin and the sins of other priests, saying that they are sinful themselves. And then there would be two goats. 
they were cast lots. The one poor goat got sacrificed. The one got sent into the, the wilderness to signify the removal of sin. And the priest would lay his hands on the one that was sacrificed. And it would signify the putting on of all the sins of Israel on that goat. I don't know if I said lamb, but the goat. And it just emphasized the seriousness of sin. And then what would happen is he would ascend to the Holy of Holies. And he would take the, the blood, firstly, of the, the ram, so that was for his own sin, and he would sprinkle that on the mercy seat and in specific places. Then he would take the blood of the, the goat and, and sprinkle that. Um, and this was, this was really significant. And after that, he would intercede for the people. And, and just picture it. So inside, he's praying for the people. Outside, they're praying, all praying, lifting up their worship to God, this combined picture of worship to God. And finally, he would return outside and pray the ironic blessing. May the Lord bless you and watch over you. May the Lord make his face shine on you. May the Lord look kindly on you and fill you with his peace. And there's this picture of wonderful peace and forgiveness that these people felt. But that peace was only temporary. So the next day, if you shouted at your friend, that peace was gone and you had to wait a year to get that peace back again. And then another year and then another year. It was something that never went away. It was an ongoing thing. Also, if you pictured that time, there was no access to God. I mean, imagine not having that, that feeling of the Holy Spirit speaking into our lives. Those of us who've experienced it, that knowledge that you are God's child. Only the, the high priest could go into the Holy of Holies once a year. And we know that sometimes the Holy Spirit came on individuals. But there was no access to God for you and me. There was this feeling of being cut off. See, the law was insufficient. The Old Testament, you see, the Hebrews were harping back to that, thinking, must we just go back to that system? But it was insufficient. Hebrews tells us it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away the sin of the people. They were people, there was goats. Big difference between goats and people. The same sacrifices repeated endlessly year after year can't make perfect those who draw near to worship. They were never good enough. They were never perfect. They were drawing near, but they couldn't actually get there because they weren't good enough and there was no access for them. But Scripture makes it clear. It's easy for us in hindsight to know this was temporary. But Scripture even then made it clear that this was temporary. Jeremiah prophesied hundreds of years before Jesus was born. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant, not like the old. And he talks about us two things as, as indicative of this covenant. We will know the Lord and our sins will be remembered no more. Think about that. Knowing the Lord because there was no access and sins remembered no more. They were remembering their sins day after day after day. And it also tells us in Hebrew, the law is only a shadow of the good things that are coming, not the realities. There's a promise of good things coming. The law is a shadow. It's a dark shadow pointing to that, but it's not those good things in themselves. The sacrificial system pointed us to our sin, to our need of God, and that God-shaped vacuum in every heart so that people were ready for Jesus when he came. That, that feeling of, I need God, I need access, I need forgiveness for my sins. In Jesus, we find the only true high priest. You see, the, old, the high priests in the Old Testament could never make it because they were sinful. They had to sacrifice sins for themselves. They weren't, the lamb had to be, or the goat in those times, and the ram had to be the, ble the unblemished offering. But they knew they were blemished. They could never fully represent God to man and man to God. If we journey through Yom Kippur, for me, that's a shadow of the reality of what Jesus has done for us. If you think that the priest, remember, he took off his, his radiant robes. You think of Jesus taking off his radiant glory, coming to be among us, among you and me. You see, to be our true high priest, Jesus needed to be our representative. I don't know if you've ever had anyone who's spoken for you, yet they know nothing of what you're going through. And they've kind of said they can speak for you. And you you don't know what I'm going through. In order to truly be our representative, Je Jesus had to both be fully God and fully human. He took on our humanity. You see, God had never experienced suffering. God had never had to obey. 
So Jesus, in coming to earth, took that on. He took on having to obey. Glorious Jesus had to do that for us. He suffered. He experienced pain. He experienced loss, rejection for us. He can claim the role as high priest because it tells us in Hebrews 4, he is able to empathize with our weaknesses. We have one who has been tempted in every way. In reality, he was tempted just as we are, yet without sin. Our names are written not on his breastplate, but on his heart, on his divine heart. And not on his shoulder, but on the cross that he carried on his shoulder and the weight of sin that he bore on himself. He bathed himself in his baptism and he lived that sinless life. We couldn't consecrate ourselves because all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all fall short, yet Jesus lived permanently in obedience and self-offering to the Father and in communion with his Father. Beautiful picture. He, at the, the high priestly prayer at the end of his life, he said, for their sakes I sanctify myself that they also might be sanctified through the truth. He sanctified himself to prepare himself. And then he offered himself as, as an offering. He didn't have to offer for his own sins because he was sinless. But he didn't offer a lamb. And in the, the case of Yom Kippur, the goat, he offered himself. He became both the high priest and the sacrifice. The one who was qualified to give the sacrifice was the only one qualified to be the sacrifice. Once for all. It's not, this is not a temporary sacrifice. Once for all, he came to do what we couldn't do for ourselves. He provided that atonement offering, and it was more just than just a covering. It tells us in Hebrews 8, 12, he removed our sin completely from us. Not just covering over it that it's there. And we were given imputed righteousness. So God accepts us in Jesus, holy. So when God looks on us, if Jesus, I've said the example before, but if, God, if Jesus is sitting there and one of us is sitting there, God would look on us the same because through Jesus, that his righteousness is ours as we have faith in him. That incredible picture that we have. No other religion where there is one great happening that brings salvation through all history and through all nations. One single happening by faith. Nothing to do with our works, but to do with the perfect sacrifice of our high priest. Spurgeon said, Jesus didn't come to the earth to make reconciliation by the holiness of his life. Yes, he led a wonderful holy life, but that wasn't what reconciled us to God. He didn't come to make reconciliation by the earnestness of his teaching, but he came to make reconciliation by his death the one perfect sacrifice. This is the Christian message of grace. And on the cross, Jesus shouted, Tetelestai, it is finished, once and for all. How we hold on to that sin, we keep repenting day after day after day. It is finished, we are forgiven. He won forgiveness for us. Often when we, we confess, it's good to repent in church for our sin. But when are we forgiven? Are we forgiven when we speak the word? Are we forgiven when we say amen? Are we forgiven when the person says, because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross, we are forgiven? We're actually forgiven before we even pray the prayer. We're forgiven way back to the cross. On the cross, sins past, present, and future were forgiven. We just need to believe it. Maybe to give an example, and this is relates to both our first initial giving of our hearts and repenting, our whole orientation of our lives, and our individual daily repentance. Evangelist Wooten, he told a story. He held many tent meetings long ago, and he was pulling up the tent pegs. It was an end of a, end of a meeting, and a young man came beh behind him and said, Mr. Wooten, sir, please can I ask you a question? And he was bending over, and he said, yes, yes, sir, go right ahead. He says, uh, well, um, what do I have to do to be saved. Mr. Wooden turned around and said, sorry, you're too late. He said, oh no, I'm too late. Uh, you mean it's too late because the service is over? No, it's too late because it's already been done. 
And then he proceeded to tell him that he didn't have to do anything, that it had all been done. He had to believe that it had been done and accept that. How important that is for us to realize that forgiveness, our repentance, is a response to grace, not a condition of grace. The grace has been already given to each one of us. That's our amen to the cross. And we join our amen with Jesus who is standing before the Father as our mediator. Jesus' work as the high priest has finished in one sense, but in another amazing sense, it continues because he is our high priest ever living to intercede for us. That is scripture, verse. He ever lives to intercede for us. He intercedes for you and me by name, even as we sit here. So he carried us on the cross. He carries us now in his heart. And that's an incredible thing because often we think there's so much burden on us and our faith. But actually, it's Jesus has done the work for us on the cross and he's praying for us and through that empowering us in our faith journey. He's the leader in our worship. And Jesus, our perfect high priest, is someone who stands in for us to do for us and in us what we can't do for ourselves. So friends, what is our response? What is our response to this act that transformed our living? This act that transformed our dying? When Jesus died, not only was forgiveness of sin given, what was the second part I mentioned at the beginning? Knowing God. What would the new covenant bring? Forgiveness of sin and knowing God. Access to the Father was given because that veil was torn in two. Hebrews 4.16, let us then approach God's throne of grace and confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. We can approach the throne of God because of what Jesus has done to receive mercy, which is not getting what we deserve. We're struggling with our sin, but we've got that mercy, that forgiveness, not get what we deserve. And we receive grace, which is getting what we don't deserve. All the blessings, all the goodness of God We get both mercy and grace to help us in our time of need. That's for every one of us. Now, many of you have heard the story Nicky Gumbel gives of the bag lady, but often it's good to give us as a reminder, where he he knew this lady in in his parish, but she wandered the streets in England. They're called bag ladies, and they wander around with their bags, and they, they get money from people just to survive. Very, very poor. And she passed away, and her funeral was held. And suddenly he found out that she came from this incredibly wealthy family. And there were millions of pounds, not rands, pounds, times by nearly 20, that were were left to her. She was this incredibly, incredibly wealthy woman. Yet she lived in poverty. She relied on the little coins given by passers-by. I think the Hebrews were a bit like that. They were getting stuck with the laws and the sacrifices, falling back on temporary change just trying to make it through another day. Okay, my sin's gone. Go to the next day. Go to the next day. Yet all the riches had been given to them in Jesus. Full and eternal forgiveness had been given. Knowing God had been given. Grace and mercy in their time of need had been given to them. In fact, it tells us in Ephesians, every spiritual blessing has been given to to us in Jesus. I will be their God and they will be my people. What about us? Do we need that reminder tonight? That mind shift change? Are we stuck in thinking we need to earn our forgiveness? Earn our goodness by what we think is somehow an adequate offering, but is yet fall so short? Our attempts to be good enough when our Heavenly Father's spiritual wealth is all ours. It's all ours. His throne room is our home, only possible through Jesus. I want to ask you, do you feel you have access to that throne room? Maybe you feel, good day, maybe 50%, maybe on a bad day, 20%. Maybe it's really rotten, maybe it's like 0%. Maybe you look at Kevin, you think, whoa, he's got like 90%. Whoa, he must have the, you know, he's got the access. He's the, you know, the, the priests, they must have access. But Jesus is the only mediator we need. Every single one of us. Kevin's got 100% access, but so has Kathy. So has every single one of us sitting here tonight got 100% access 
There's no such thing as a, a priest in the New Testament in leadership other than Jesus is our high priest. And then I'll talk about the second part. That is, the second part is that we're all called to be priests. That we're all called to be priests, to share his praises to the world. So actually you should be going out from here calling each other reverent. Not Reverend Anne, not Reverend Trish, not Reverend Hank, you know, not Reverend Keegan. Going out like that because we are all called to be priests. We're called to be representatives to, to the world, to represent God to the world, but also to bear the world on our hearts and in prayer before God. And our prayers join with our high priest Jesus. It's not about external sacrifices as a condition of grace, but as a response to grace, we offer our bodies as a living sacrifice. And I just want to mention this briefly. I was just going to mention it in passing, but it came up twice in the prayers. Hank was praying about it, and then Trish had this picture of us offering our bodies as a living sacrifice on a silver platter. And for me, that's, that's almost God's riches, that we're offering what we have been given ourselves. But if you think about it, because sometimes we think, sure, that's hard. We've got to offer ourselves. I do things for Steve because I love him. I didn't... Um, offer myself to him and I didn't do things so I could marry him or I don't do things for him so I could stay married to him. Well, I don't think so. <laughs> no, I don't do things so I could stay married to him. But I do things because how he showers love and scrambled egg on me. <laughs> if any of you were here last week, he makes the best scrambled egg. So I do it because of what I receive and the blessings I receive and I just want to give out of that. It's a response to that grace that I've received. And, and each one of us, we offer ourselves as a living sacrifice in response, in response to the grace of our Heavenly Father, in response to receiving every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms. Friends, let's live in the fullness of his sacrifice, in the fullness of his forgiveness, in the fullness of his victory, and the fullness of his blessing won for us. Let's not settle for the loose change. Let's pray. Father, we know it's not a question of guilt or innocence, but it's a question of whether we accept the perfect sacrifice, Jesus Christ. He had to die. He had to die to be our substitute in judgment. He had to die because forgiveness demands blood. He had to die in order to free the legacy of the Father to belong to us. Jesus, thank you for dying. Thank you for shedding your blood on our behalf. God, I pray that no one would leave this place tonight who has not put their faith in the death of Jesus, who does not believe that he bore their sins in his own body and that he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Oh Lord, may we believe it. Those of us who have heard many, many times, those of us who have received you, Lord, may we be reminded tonight of that 100% access. We sang that song, help us know you are near. Lord, for you are near. It is us who turn ourselves away. Lord, may we not live on the the small change. May we live in the riches, the spiritual blessings, the inheritance that you would pour out on each one of us, that you would journey with us, that you would give us mercy and help, mercy and grace to help us in our time of need.